Hello, everyone. My name is Mi Jin Cha. I'm an assistant professor in an urban and environmental policy at Occidental Hill College. Welcome to INED's cl live climate debates. This session will discuss just transition, what will it take, and can it be done? Uh, this is an issue that's very close to my heart. It's one that I think a lot about, uh, and I think it's really the keystone about whether uh, that will determine whether our low carbon transition will in fact be just, or if it will just be another example of business as usual. So I'm very excited for this debate and really excited to hear what people, uh, our distinguished panelists have to say. Joining us today are uh, Mark Lee. Mark Lee is a senior economist with the British Columbia Office of the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives. Mark joined the CCPA in 1998 and is one of Canada's leading progressive commentators on economic and social policy issues. Mark led the CCPA's Climate Justice Project, which published a wide range of research on fair and effective approaches to climate action through integrating principles of social justice. We also have with us Dr. Destiny Nock, who is an assistant professor of civil and environmental engineering, as well as engineering and public policy at Carnegie Mellon University. In her role as a director of the Energy, Equity and Sustainability Group, she leads a team of researchers at the intersection of social justice, energy analysis and systems modeling. And last but certainly not least, we have Dr. Manuel Pastor, uh, Dr. Pastor is a distinguished professor of sociology and American studies and ethnicity at the University of Southern California. He currently directs the Equity Research Institute at USC. Uh, he holds an economics PhD from the University of Massachusetts Amherst and is the inaugural holder of the Turpangian Chair in Civil Society and Social Change at USC. So throughout this debate, we'll take uh, questions from audience. Please put them in the Q&A box uh, and, at any time. Um, so without further ado, let's get started. Uh, we'll start with Mark. Uh, our panelists will do an opening statement about three to four minutes, and then we'll open up for questions. So again, please put questions in the Q&A box at any time. Um, and Mark, I'll pass it off to you. OK, uh, thank you so much, Ami Jin. And, and thanks, everyone, for uh, being part of this. It's really great to be here. Um, I think I've been doing a lot of you know, research on the idea of climate justice uh, going back you know, 13 or 14 years, uh, and I've been really interested in some of the, the big questions around you know, who benefits from uh, fossil fuels and, and who pays the price when it comes to things like uh, uh, climate disasters. Uh, here where I am in British Columbia, uh, we just had um, a, a heat dome event, uh, they called it, um, you know, record heat waves that essentially shattered of all of the previous temperature records uh, in one place uh, about a you know hour and a half from where I live, uh, we set the all-time Canadian land temperature record one day, uh, and the town literally burned to the ground uh, the next. Um, and that was uh, you know late June, early July. That heat wave then set in place uh, massive wildfires that uh, were devastating the province through most of the summer, and only just recently uh, has. Has there been um, uh, a bit of a respite with some some cooler uh, and wetter weather? So um, you know, it used to be thought that you know climate change was something that might happen to polar bears a, a century down the road, uh, but it's something that's very present here and now. And um, you know, a wildfire can destroy your town, uh, and a flood could uh, take out your house. Uh, heat waves could kill your grandmother. I mean, these are all realities that we're living with uh, in the here and now. So we need. Uh, rapid action to phase out uh, fossil fuels as quickly as possible. Uh, I'm encouraged by the new conversations around net zero, though I see a lot of loopholes that try to preserve the status quo through uh, things like direct air capture and carbon sequestration and, and storage. Um, but so I think fun fundamentally, if we want to uh, get a handle on this, you know, we need to be asking, um, you know, how we do that in a way that's inclusive and that's democratic. Uh, what version of humanity are we trying to save? Are we just trying to swap out all of our uh, carbon polluting uh, technologies for ones that are zero carbon so that our billionaires fly around in hydrogen powered jets and our sweatshops are powered by uh, by solar panels? Uh, that's not a version of, of humanity that that uh, that I want. So I think we need to put these these issues of uh, inequality, you know, at the center uh, of the debate. Um, the research shows that you know the top ten percent uh, you know, are responsible for about half of the emissions, um, and so that's a you know really central. And the bottom fifty percent of humanity, uh, only about thirteen percent. So there's a, there's huge uh, discrepancies in terms of who benefits and who's paying the price. 
Uh, and I think that's got to be at the heart of it. And, you know, moving forward, I think there's a lot of scope for addressing those simultaneously to, to find the win-wins that uh, dramatically reduce our emissions profile, uh, but that also achieve justice in a number of areas that uh, uh, link that to uh, transportation justice, to uh, re dramatic reductions in energy poverty, to the creation of, of good, uh, well-paying, decent jobs uh, in the transition away from fossil fuels. Uh, a more just, you know, food system that has, you know, bet, you know, better access and better nutrition and better supports uh, local farmers. You know, all of these things are, are areas where I think we should be looking for uh, for those those win wins. Um, and if we can do that, then I think we actually build the political support uh, for uh, a human civilization that's here for the long term. And I'll stop there. Great, thank you so much, Mark. Uh, Destiny. Okay, so I believe that one of the biggest challenges in achieving a just transition will be getting on the same page about definitions and making sure that we have a clear picture of what we mean by a just transition. We know that just like reaching a uh, environmental sustainable transition, it is very complicated. There are multiple facets and there's different ways to approach um, that definition. And so one key thing is going to be understanding historical injustices, but also understanding how the technologies that we deploy may create unforeseen injustices that we have not seen currently. And, you know, we may, you know, be exacerbating some problems. And so, for example, one is the, you know, resource constraint problem. There are different resources available to different communities. And so when I'm thinking of low-income communities that don't own the infrastructure of the home that they live in, then requiring electric vehicles can create some discrepancies in who's able to charge, especially if those electric vehicles have long charging times, then we need to think about public infrastructure for charging, right? And then as gas prices are increasing, and we also have the double whammy of gentrification, people being pushed out of, you know, these economic hubs because it's getting too expensive, then, you know, how are we going to make sure that everybody can afford to get to work um, as we are, you know, electrifying our transportation sector? So getting on the same page about definitions, what that means, but then also trying to forecast um, what types of injustices may occur as we transition our energy systems is going to be super important. And then also being clear on, you know, what we are defining as poverty and how we are identifying who is experiencing poverty. One of the things that we've been working on in my research group is to look at different households um, based on different demographics like minorities and low income communities and look at how much energy they're using at different outdoor temperatures to identify who may be experiencing a lack of energy. Um, because one thing that we know is that households are going to be very financially savvy and yes, Poverty can look like one person or one household spending a large percent of their income meeting their energy needs, but it could also look like a person not being able to use as much energy as necessary during a heat wave to cool their home or during the winter to avoid, you know, really dangerous indoor temperatures. And so um, if you remember nothing else, definitions, being very clear about what the goal is and being very clear about you know, how are we identifying who is experiencing injustices and poverty, and then trying to make sure that we are looking for any gaps in those, um, in our current identification strategies. Great, thank you so much, Destiny. Uh, and then Manuel. Uh, thanks, Mijin, and so much to say, including the fact that you and I are co-authors on this issue of just transition, uh, would have been part of my introduction to be sure. So I wanted to say a word about how I came to this work and then uh, pick up on a couple of things that other folks have uh, said. Uh, you know, I actually came to this work through environmental justice uh, research and work with activists on environmental justice issues. Actually began researching environmental inequities in the middle of the 1990s, particularly in Southern California. Uh, after spending a lot of time demonstrating the extent of the disparities. And also, interestingly, for at least part of your audience, demonstrating that the disparities were actually more severe by race than they were by income, implying that it really is a sort of difference in 
political power and structural racism that's created so many vulnerabilities and not just the market. Uh, after doing so much of that sort of research work, have turned in recent years to try to figure out how to uh, figure out which communities are uh, overexposed and socially vulnerable and how to make sure that those communities get the resources that they need. In the process of moving from looking at issues like uh, air pollution, uh, proximity to amenities like parks, et cetera, began to work in the realm of climate. And if, uh, you know, Destiny said, if there's one thing you should remember, she said the thing she said. For me, if there's one thing you should remember, it's that climate change is real, but so is the climate gap. That is the fact that there are certain communities that are disproportionately exposed to the risks from climate change, who are disproportionately exposed to the co-pollutants that go along with greenhouse gas emissions, that are disproportionately left out of the conversations about what to do about moving to a less carbon intensive uh, future. Uh, and it is that climate gap that we actually need to address in all of our policy making. I'm sure that we'll get to more aspects of this, but I wanted to pick up on another thing that Destiny said about really the time dimension of equity. Uh, we thought a lot about this and thought about that when you're talking about dealing with equity and fairness, that you've got three time dimensions. One is to recognize what has happened in the past. So when we look at our urban landscapes and we see who is living near heat islands, that's a reflection of uh, uh, racial segregation, uh, residential redlining, underinvestment in parks and tree canopies, and it creates a current risk right now. So it's looking at the past. It's also looking at the present. Do we actually have mechanisms to incorporate communities into the planning for transition? Because if we have mechanisms to incorporate low-income communities fully into the uh, planning for transition, then we will arrive at a just transition that deals with some of these problems that we've inherited and some of the problems that we're creating right now. But critically, what Destiny pointed to is thinking about equity future casting, trying to understand whether or not the uh, sort of mechanisms we put in right now to deal with a transition to a less carbon intensive or carbon free future are going to actually exacerbate inequalities. So as we move to electric vehicles, something she pointed out to, are we creating the second hand markets for used EVs that are gonna be more accessible to low income folks? Are we investing in the public uh, charging infrastructure to make sure that people who live in apartments and not just people who live in houses actually have access to be able to charge vehicles? When there's this fascination with carbon markets and offsets that many economists have, are we recognizing the fact that those systems are inherently unequal, that, which may not make that much difference for greenhouse gas emissions, because everywhere you reduce a greenhouse gas emission, it's got a global benefit, but they make a big difference for the co-pollutants. And these are inherently unequal systems. That's the point of a market system, that you're going to get geographic inequalities because there'll be someone who reduces their pollution and is paid to do it, and someone who doesn't reduce their pollution and pays to get their way out of it. That inequality in greenhouse gas emissions, not a problem. But greenhouse gas emissions come packaged with uh, PM10, PM2.5, other emittance. And one of the things we've looked at in the state of California is how the first couple of phases of the cap and trade markets have produced inequalities in terms of the riskape of the co-pollutants. And an article just this weekend in the Los Angeles Times has pointed out the abuses of the offset system uh, where people have bought offsets for things that would have occurred anyway, and then also wound up not reducing pollution in low-income communities of color, but instead bought forest lands in places that will uh, never 
uh, see the light of day of people who live in these over uh, impacted communities. So past, present, future, when we're thinking about a just transition, it's repairing the damage of the past. It's making sure there's full participation in design for what we do moving forward. And it's making sure that we do not make the mistakes that reproduce inequalities going forward. Thank you so much, Manuel. Um, you know, I'm really struck by a few issues uh, and please also continue to put uh, questions in the question and answer box. But uh, to me, you know, as Manuel always says, you know, just transition is a transition to justice, which is a, a good time to plug our conference for next week, uh, our net kind of conference on Tuesday, which uh, please sign up for. Um, but, you know, as, we're, as I was listening to all of you talk, there's these elements that are just uh, consistent, right? You know, Mark, your discussion of how you could really distort net zero to really, you know, subsidize the billionaires at the cost of the rest of us. And, you know, Destiny, your idea of, you know, your points about like, how are we defining poverty and, you know, who is benefiting and who is losing? Uh, and Manuel, of course, as you always lay out so well, you know, what is, these are all issues of injustice that exist. And to me, it seems that um, there are these long standing issues and why. I think, Manuel, you talk about a transition to justice is that unless we address these issues, we can't actually get to the energy transition parts. Um, and so I was wondering if you all could speak a little bit more to that. And I think that that kind of, uh, you know, the social and economic issues can tend to really either derail climate action or get to, you know, a lot of climate advocates, I think, can think we don't have time to do these inclusive processes, right? Or that these are outside the scope of climate policy. Um, but we can never really get to that transition to justice without, you know, addressing the underlying inequalities. So I wonder if you all have some thoughts on, you know, either how you message or how you build the coalition or how you can convince people, how we convince people that we needed this transition to justice, not just an energy transition. Uh, and I, Destiny, why don't we start with you? So I think that one of the biggest challenges is making it local and making people understand that it's not just about, you know, helping those poor people over there, but making a just and equitable transition benefits everybody. And there is, you know, a wealth of research that shows that when you have injustices in one part of society, then everybody it's to everybody's detriment. And I think that, you know, too easy it's to say, um, too, it's too easy to say sometimes that, oh, well, you know, I'm doing good and, you know, it's okay and I don't see anything wrong here. So let's just keep doing what we're doing because that's what's working. And the challenge is to get people to take a step back and realize that that comes from a place of privilege. Like you've most likely been really privileged to grow up in a place with, you know, clean water, clean air, you know, economic opportunities, and you have benefited from that. But there, are, but there are other people that have not been able to benefit or have, you know, fallen to the wayside because of the way that, you know, the system has unequitably been benefiting um, different people. And so in terms of the messaging, I mean, they do say that in general, scientists have really long winded answers <laughs> for, you know, things and, and the truth spreads so much faster because um, you know, we want to be correct and we want to make sure that people have all of the facts, they can make up their own mind. And then, you know, the, the lies will spread like really quickly of, you know, oh, like if you create jobs over here, then you're going to lose jobs over there. And that's not necessarily the case. I think that we need to get people to approach this transition from a mentality of abundance, not scarcity, because there are a lot of jobs to be created. And we should in try to ensure that those jobs are equitably distributed. There's a lot of benefits to net zero transitions. And there is this you know, push to move as quickly as possible because we're seeing the effects of you know, climate change now with heat waves and extreme weather events. And um, a lot of times you know, people are saying, well, you know, we can't do it right now because we need to solve the climate crisis now. And I think that you know, when we're thinking about the speed at which to move, the real speed that we need to move at is the speed of trust. Because if people cannot trust in our um, engineered systems, if you know we get to this net zero energy transition, but all of a sudden people can't afford their light bills and they can't afford their heating bills, is that really a, a sustainable transition, right? And then there are going to be risks associated with um, social discourse and you know lack of achieving, you know. It, a, a, a future where everybody is able to afford their bills and use as much energy as they need to create healthy indoor environments. 
Well, I can't resist adding to that, uh, and that adding to that answer and answering that question. Um, then I'm kind of conscious of my role as someone who was, uh, sorry about that, that's a, uh, like just another example of people needing to be able to use as much energy as they need. <laughs> well, that's because I wasn't moving around. If I move around, I guess the light will stay on. But uh, uh, the thing I was going to say is I, I'm conscious of my role as someone who was trained as an economist and the fact that there are economic students and others interested in economics on this uh, in this audience. And one of the things that's been traditionally taught in economics is this whole notion of an equity efficiency trade-off. So that if we're paying attention to fairness, somehow we're going to sort of put a dent into prosperity. Uh, and if we were paying attention, in this case, to questions of environmental justice, maybe we're not going to make as much progress on addressing climate change. And that's uh, BS. That is the stuff of neoliberal thinking that has kind of poisoned the ability to understand the power of mutuality. There's an increasing level of research that is demonstrating that when you have societies that are more equal, less segregated, less torn apart, they're able to sustain employment growth over time. We've contributed to that looking at American metropolitan regions, the International Monetary Fund, a well-known leftist organization has contributed to looking at that at a country level. And we need to be thinking about those sweet spots where equity and prosperity come together. And it's similar around climate change. Uh, there's a wonderful article by some of our colleagues who will be at the conference next week. Jim, uh, Jim Boyce is one of them. She has one of the greatest titles, Is Environmental Justice Good for White Folks? And what they figured out was that in places where there's a lot of environmental disparity, there's just a lot worse of an environment. And the reason is, is that when you think you can put it in someone else's backyard, you wind up just getting more of it. And there's a little bit of that that's going on with climate too. When you think that you can escape the worst of the climate crisis, then you don't address it overall. When you think it's only the lower ninth ward in uh, New Orleans that's going to be destroyed by a hurricane because their levees aren't good enough, you wind up having that weakest link wind up destroying the whole city. So we need to be thinking about how it is that we take these issues of fairness and kind of wed them into what is the main agenda for uh, dealing with climate. And this is important for two other reasons. One is if you look at the polling data, this is from California over the last 12 years, but it's showing up for the nation now as well. If you ask the question in California, do you think that climate change is a very serious crisis, one that you think that the state really ought to deal with? It? About 50% of white Californians say yes. Uh, about 57, 58% of black and Asian Californians say yes. And about two thirds of Latino Californians say yes. That is, people of color are actually more worried about the climate because for them, it's heat waves, it's air pollution, it's asthma for your kids, it's a lot of stuff. That's the constituency that we need to bring into a transition and the reason why it needs to be a just transition. And finally, it's also why you need to address the other dimensions of inequality. First, that's just a good thing to do. Second, you want as powerful a set of constituencies on the side of addressing climate as possible. And when you are not addressing the educational and job and other inequalities that face low-income communities and communities of color in the United States, that those are communities that are then more disempowered. And the more empowered they are, the more we're going to be addressing climate in ways that benefit everyone. I'm wondering how this plays out in Canada. <laughs> well, <laughs> just so happens I'm from Vancouver. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the things that I would add to this part of the conversation is that you know I think we're shifting the grounds, or we need to shift the ground away from an approach that's more market oriented and kind of green consumerism. So I think we've had an era of the last couple decades where you know people have been encouraged to buy 
greener products um, and that, you know, most economists gravitate towards carbon pricing as a solution. So, you know, over time we increase the carbon price and eventually we quote unquote internalize the externality uh, so that market prices better reflect, you know, the damages associated with climate change. That whole exercise is, is, is kind of fraught. And I, and I think carbon pricing is, a, is, you know, certainly part of what we can do if we do it in a way that uh, understands the, the regressive impacts on low income households and compensates for them. Uh, it also can raise a lot of money for the public investments we need. So I think ultimately we need to shift away from this kind of green consumer mindset to things that are more like structural change and that reflect collective action. You know, obviously climate change is the mega collective action problem uh, of the world. Uh, but to make that more concrete, I think if we think about transportation, like a lot of the emphasis right now is on uh, electric vehicles. And a lot of government policy right now is aimed in Canada uh, at subsidizing the purchase of electric vehicles. Uh, most of those are purchased by uh, affluent households. Uh, a lot of low-income households you know, aren't buying an electric vehicle. Uh, they're much more uh, reliant on, on public transit. So when we think about, okay, what's the, what's the change we're trying to make? Are we trying to like swap every internal combustion engine with an electric engine, you know, through capital stock turnover over time? Um, I don't think that's the approach we necessarily want to go, but nor do we want to turn every trip in a private car, whether electric or not, into a trip on the bus. Um, you know, I think we want to be thinking about, well, what's the structural change here? And uh, urban planners call it sort of the development of, of complete communities. So, um, you know, more dense housing, uh, closer to people live closer to where they work and play and access public services and other amenities, more inherently walkable and bikeable communities. So that even if you're a climate change denier, uh, you're going to live a more fundamentally uh, low carbon lifestyle simply because of the, the urban fabric that uh, that you live in. So to me, that's an agenda around uh, building more dedicated, affordable housing uh, in cities, uh, you know, on land that's currently reserved for, for single family households, which here in Vancouver, you know, almost no one uh, can afford uh, anymore because of the, the cost of land has, has gone up so much. Uh, and then, you know, it's going to take a lot of labor to build that housing. So uh, that's there's your part of your jobs transition strategy uh, right there. And the housing that we build should be at essentially passive house or, or higher standards so that the overall footprint associated with it is, uh, uh, is very low and we can uh, use embodied wood instead of concrete to lower emissions. So all of these things are sort of, I think, form like a, a self-reinforcing um, dynamic where we're fundamentally lowering the, the, the footprint of society over the long term. You know, we can anchor that with a lot of public investments and things like public transit uh, and other public investments for seniors housing and healthcare and, and that kind of thing. So if we start to think about it as a, an investment agenda uh, that's not investing in fossil fuels, but that's investing in the stuff that we want that's going to improve quality of life and standard of living across a number of dimensions. I think that's what I'm talking about in terms of the win-wins that, that we want want to see. Mijin, if I could add mm -hmm. one thing and then ask a question, which is, I think that one of the things that's coming out strongly and clearly is that there's a sort of old definition of just transition, which had a lot to do with compensating losers. Uh, that has had a lot to do with saying, what are we going to do about coal miners who lose their job? What are we going to do about uh, people in the fossil fuel industry? retraining, et cetera, et cetera, or on the economic side, uh, if in fact energy uh, costs go up, how do we deal with some of the regressive impacts of this? But I think what you're hearing is that just transition is also about dealing with bad land use patterns. It's about dealing with uh, questions of people who've been locked out of job markets for years, not just people who had a job but need to transition. It's about dealing with uh, questions of overexposure to pollution. And so one of the reasons I think the shift to transition to justice is that it helps move us away from the way in which not this group, but in the past, just transition got very narrowly interpreted as sort of compensating the losers. Uh, and then I feel like I would be remiss on the part of the panel if we didn't ask you a question because uh, you're such a leader in this field as well. I know you're supposed to be just moderating, but can you talk a little bit about the politics of just transition? What are the kind of 
coalitions that you think need to be built to kind of pull people in this direction? I know you weren't expecting that, but since you know me, you know the unexpected will come for me. Uh, it's true, and it's one of my favorite things about you, Manuel. <laughs> um, I think it's also maybe a good way to transition to, I'm happy to answer the question, and then it just does transition to a question that has come in through the Q&A, which is, you know, how do we square our aspirations for a just transition with our current political realities? Um, and I think the answer lies into what you have brought up, Manuel, about you know, we need a strong, diverse coalition, not just because we think more people should be involved, but because, as you mentioned, we need to build power. Right. So, you know, in the work that we have done looking at how to build power at the state level, uh, we can not no one group can do this alone. Right. We've actually I would argue we've tried a climate only insider technocratic approach in the U.S., you know, with the work max. Uh, Waxman Markey bill, uh, the last big push for climate bill, you know, the cap and trade bill really failed spectacularly. Um, and I think part of it was that we did not do the organizing and pull, um, power building that we needed to, right? Uh, I think we need to have labor, environmental justice, environmental groups, community-based organizations, people that are really going to be directly impacted by this energy transition, which will actually be all of us, right? And I think you know, as you always talk about, Manuel, it's not just that we have to build power, but we have to reduce power. We have to reduce the power of the fossil fuel industry. And the only way that we can do that is really by building these big, diverse coalitions. Um, as we have seen in our work, you know, if we look at New York, for instance, that big climate bill that they passed, it was over 100 groups that came together across all uh, interest areas. And that, you know, really does create the momentum and the power to push legislative um to push legislators into the direction that we need them to do to embrace the ambitious policies that we need. Um, so I, I think people want to hear from all of you. So uh, maybe I'll pass it back. So what do you think, how do we advance this just transition with our current political reality? Well, I mean, sorry, I was going to get back to the part about Canada. Um, so we just had a, a national, like a federal election in Canada a couple days ago. Uh, and 60% uh, of the voters voted for uh, parties that uh, support uh, robust climate action. Uh, and, you know, to, to varying you know, degrees, but, uh, you know, Canada, it's been a long slog in Canada, to be honest. Um, when um, for years, Canada has been making commitments uh, to reduce its emissions and then not developing plans uh, to meet them. Uh, only in the wake of the Paris Agreement have our politicians started to get uh, more serious uh, about this. Uh, the, the just re-elected uh, Liberal government uh, brought in place uh, a carbon pricing framework um, that uh, essentially sets a national standard. It allows provinces to develop their own carbon pricing frameworks as long as they meet a, a certain minimum standard. And if they don't, then the federal government will impose it in their jurisdiction and return the revenues back to that jurisdiction, to, uh, to actual households. Uh, so there's a you know there's a direct sort of you know financial uh, link, which is a little bit like the you know cap and dividend that's been proposed uh, for for a long time, uh, and uh, and they brought in some other measures as well, like beyond carbon pricing, so zero emission mandates, a lot of building retrofits, uh, phase out of of coal fired electricity has been a really big one um, in Canada, uh, along with the just transition planning uh, associated with that for the workers that are uh, actually you know, affected. So I think we're starting to 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 bend the curve uh, in. in Canada and getting get away from the rhetoric around uh, reducing emissions to actual policies. And for the first time that this federal election, there was a substantive public debate on climate policy. It wasn't about whether climate change was happening or not, or, you know, whether we should bother, uh, but it was really around the details. Even our conservative party, which, you know, had been very uh, intransigent on climate change for a long time, uh, felt the need to sort of embrace carbon pricing and put proposals on the table. And we had like an actual substantive public uh, debate on that. So I think that you know, definitely needs to happen. You know, we need to have it be part of, of our politics. I would also suggest that, you know, you know, politics is very detached from where a lot of people are at. And what one of the things we did in our climate justice project was uh, we had a conversation on, on climate uh, justice. So we we, uh, we 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 dimly went out. We we took the kind of the sort of seven different Americas, and we 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 stripped out the climate hawks and we stripped out the climate deniers. But we took a lot of the people in the middle who were concerned 
uh, to varying degrees, uh, but were not really active. And we brought them together from all walks of life, all parts of, of the region of, of metropolitan Vancouver to have a conversation about how we actually move forward on this. And so, you know, Destiny talked about moving at the speed of trust. And I think to some extent, we need to have some trust that, that people with good intentions sitting around the table can actually come up with uh, solutions and can better understand their different perspectives uh, on this and that you know it's it, it getting away from sort of an economics where we know the answers and we impose it on everyone else those need to be ground truth and the realities that that people face and that the day-to-day -day barriers they are they confront in their in their day-to-day -day lives and i think if we had like you know a whole bunch of those like scattered across uh, you know north america we could really advance uh, the the yardsticks and have much better understanding of how people are being affected and how we can develop policies that are like truly inclusive rather than just saying so i think that there's also this um you know need to make sure that we're holding the right people accountable and you know there's been talks about like leakage with carbon trading where you know you're not full, like you're not fully accounting for the emissions at the generation source and that have been delivered um and then like kind of leaks out because like it's not really being accounted for when you have like a lot of different entities like trading those carbon emissions and so then and then there's also like this like scapegoating kind of nature because you know, a lot of people agree that climate change is bad. And now we're all looking to, you know, find the perpetrators, which a lot of people will agree, fossil fuel companies. Um, but then, you know, they try to get out of it with like the clean coal, the clean carbon, um, you know, carbon capture and storage. And, you know, even then we have to think, okay, well, where are they storing it? How is that going to create like new disparities in like these different communities? And so I think that, you know, in our current political landscape, one of the things that I've noticed since um, the pandemic has happened is, you know, paying a lot more attention to politics. Because uh, I, you know, I believe that before um, this, and maybe it's because a lot of people were at home watching <laughs> watching the news, but that the people were like, oh, it's politics, I don't want to deal with it, right? And then now you see a lot more like activism. I mean, even with the Black Lives Matter movement, I saw a lot more of debates going on about like what was happening in these communities that opens you up to talk more about like environmental justice impacts. And then, you know, when we were talking about wanting a diverse landscape, being brave enough when somebody says, oh, well, you know, I, I want to hire people based on merit, you know, then actually reminding them, no, like diverse voices are, you know, valuable because if I'm trying to come up with new technologies to prevent future injustices, Maybe we should have some people at the table who have been at the receiving end of past injustices or else we are going to risk exacerbating the current system and we're not going to have new creative ideas about um, how to solve these problems because we don't have people that have experienced um, those problems that we're trying to solve. And so, you know, if I'm looking for an expert on climate in terms of lived experience, then I would go to, you know, communities where people are living in those heat islands and talk to somebody who has had trouble you know, turning on their heat and somebody who just felt invisible for a long time because, you know, they didn't know how to get those energy subsidies. And then we can talk about barriers, right? Not just resource barriers of do you in your home, but do you have access to the internet in your home or do you have to go to the library? And then during the pandemic, that's going to be another, another challenge. And then with jobs in the energy sector, you know, a big barrier to access is transportation to that job. So if those jobs are not near public transportation, they're not near bus stops, it's very hard to get to without a car. Right now you also have these exacerbated um, inequalities. And so then um, if I could just jump back to something earlier that Mark had talked about with um, the green consumerism, um, I do want to like remind people, you know, that that is something that has been uh, advertised and ingrained into our current way of thinking by you know, big companies. I believe that it started with the like bottle industry when they were moving from glass bottles to plastic bottles. And before they were responsible for recollecting all those glass bottles and washing them and reusing them and disposing of them. But then when they switched to plastic, right now the ownership is on the consumer to recycle, right? And then, you know, you're bad if you don't recycle. Then we have ex now with recycling, you have a lot more emissions because the recycling process is very, is a lot more emissions intensive than actually collecting a bunch of bottles and, and, you know, recycling them. And so now we actually could have that risk when we're looking at the energy sector, 
where we're doing like carbon capture and storage. It's on the consumers to buy EVs and get solar panels on their homes and, um, you know, get clean green batteries and, you know, buy all these energy technologies, which are going to take a lot of energy to create in the first place when we actually did have this centralized system using like, you know, the economies of scale that we want to green um, because you can have a large swath of the population on this centralized system. And I am not saying that it's perfect. <laughs> so, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to say that the centralized system is perfect, but, you know, we should make sure that we're not going to put the ownership on the consumer to buy the green technologies, that we should make sure that, you know, we are not going to lose focus on those fossil fuel companies when we are thinking about who is who needs to be accountable for the greenhouse gas emissions that we're trying to reduce. So I would just add that this is a very tough problem. And I think the way you framed it, Mijin, really points to the idea that in order to change the current system in which we provide power, we need to change the system of political power. And quite often we're looking for a technological fix. There's gonna be an EV, there's gonna be carbon capture, there's gonna be a more efficient market, and that's gonna change it. When in fact, this economy overall, and particularly the way we provide energy, reflects a system of political power and that's uh, vested in these large uh, energy providers who have a stake in not uh, having their current capital equipment uh, investments kind of go to waste. So it's very, very difficult at the national level to continue to move this forward as we are seeing. I have a lot of hope, uh, and then I'll end with some skeptic or pessimism, uh, that about what's going on at a state level. You pointed to the New York example, living here in California with a commitment to uh, uh, going completely renewable by 2035, I think it is at this point. Uh, there's uh, quite a, uh, there's issues with it, uh, but climate equity issues have been taken more seriously so that the revenues from cap and trade, while it's not a dividend system, uh, there's a commitment to put 35% of it into uh, frontline communities most affected by uh, environmental vulnerability and social vulnerability. And in fact, the state seems to be doing a little bit better than that. There's some moves toward community air monitoring to look at the questions of co-pollutants, et cetera. So I'm somewhat hopeful that these state experiments can uh, breed success. And as they uh, are successful, can help to move people along to what a just transition could look like by providing an example. One thing that I think is really critical to pay attention to is a kind of fundamental underlying shift in our ideological tension, which I think is going to make this a little bit more difficult and it means that we need to take culture a little bit more seriously. Traditionally, the way we think about the ideological divide generally, certainly right, left, uh, Republican, Democrat, et cetera, is kind of individualism versus collectivism. Whether or not you think people are acting in their own self-interest, whether or not there's markets that will coordinate that to bliss, um, et cetera, or you think that these are big collective problems, certainly climate change is, and that they need state solutions. And that's traditionally been our ideological divide in the country. But over the last 10 or more years, we've moved to tribalism versus mutuality. The Trump phenomena was not about individualism. I mean, it wound up selling, to, uh, getting tax cuts for corporations, but it was really about appealing to tribalism of white Americans, white working class Americans, that they were about to be invaded by immigrants and the threat of demographic change, et cetera. And this tribalism is reflected too in who is opposed to climate change, uh, sort of, you know, creating 
uh, a fervor in coal mining country that someone is coming after not just your jobs, because they might promise jobs, but they're coming after your tribe. They're coming after who you are, what your culture is, et cetera. Similar thing that we found look together looking in Louisiana where people identify, I mean, with the jobs and industries that are causing them so much health, pain, and anxiety. And this tribalism is getting in the way of recognizing mutuality. The fact that we collectively need to solve this, not just through the state, but through sort of widening the circle of belonging and creating a bigger sense of who the we is. Um, and so I think this is a, such a big task that goes beyond what economics and economic policy can do. It gets to questions of organizing, questions of narrative, questions of belonging, because when we look at each other and we say, we do not want at our border to have our border patrolled by people on horses whipping desperate Asian migrants, that that fundamentally violates who we are. When we develop that deep sense of empathy, then these questions of dealing with climate justice are going to become second nature. And so the fundamental questions are big, broad, political, uh, and about who we are. Uh, I'm gonna have to sign off in about three minutes to go teach a class, uh, which is why I'm in an office I'm not usually in, which only has one book, which my colleagues were making fun of me because they're far more learned than they are. Look at those number of books Mark has and that beautiful art Destiny has. All I've got is one sad book. Uh, but anyway, those are my thoughts and I'll uh, stay on for just a minute or two more and then drop off. Been so pleased to be on this panel with such brilliant uh, visionaries. Thank you so much, Manuel. Um, so I, I don't know if you want to answer this briefly in the time that you have, or we can continue on, but I, there are two questions that I think kind of get to what I would say is about the kind of the market implications of climate policy and also, you know, design policy design, like how are we designing our climate policies? So one is that, you know, nature-based solutions are often touted as a way to get away from oil and gas investments. Um, is that another form of greenwashing? And another one, which I think is along the same lines uh, is, you know, do you think there's a role for allocating carbon budgets for at the individual and household level, particularly for those that are the top 10 most consuming of carbon? Uh, sure, I, I can jump in. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think we should be trading uh, nature for fossil fuel uh, emissions. So uh, a lot of what our build as nature-based solutions are genuinely good things that we should be doing. You know, we should be uh, preventing further deforestation uh, here in British Columbia, where I am, you know, we're down to the last strands of, you know, old growth forests, which sequester huge amounts uh, of carbon. Uh, you know, we should be preventing the conversion of grasslands into new croplands for, for, for big agriculture. Those are good things to do, but we shouldn't be doing that to generate credits so that big polluters can continue to pollute. Uh, you know, we need to do both. Like in, in some ways, because we have so overshot uh, in terms of, you know, parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, that carbon's already spoken for. We need to do a bunch of those things. We need to do reforestation. We need to do a lot of the natural stuff just to suck back some of the carbon that's already uh, in the atmosphere. Uh, but we, we definitely shouldn't be using it as a, a, a means of perpetuating business as usual. We need to, you know, phase out the use of fossil fuels for, for energy uh, as rapidly uh, as possible, not even 2050, but you know, much sooner than that. And I think we've demonstrated that you know, we can actually do this. It's just a matter of political will. And if anything, you know, the, the COVID experience tells us that we can move very quickly when it comes to policy uh, if we're really pressed. And I would argue that we're at, in that moment where we're really pressed, you know, that climate change is bearing down on us. Uh, in terms of like the idea of, of individual carbon budgets, it's a little bit less clear to me how that would actually work in practice. But certainly there are things that we could do. So, you know, air travel is is one where, you know, the, the benefits of air travel have been so disproportionately uh, you know, consumed by the, the top 10 percent, if not the top 
uh, 1%. There's, I see no reason why rich people should be flying around in private jets. Uh, and I think even just for commercial air travel, um, you know, there should be a, a progressive carbon tax on every flight that you take so that, you know, by the if you're third or fourth flight a year, you're paying a massive, massive uh, amount uh, of carbon tax. And, and, you know, so let's, it, let's, let's keep air travel, let's decarbonize it, but let's, uh, let, let's share the, the benefits of that uh, much more broadly. I'm going to go ahead and sign off, but I would echo what Mark just said, particularly the last part of it, about thinking about the ways in which you could use some elements of market systems to really tax the highest users and try to figure out how to create those uh, funds in ways that will allow for some of the investments that need to take place. I also think that a progressive tax on uh, air travel, the more you travel, the more you're taxed, would be supported by Zoom, uh, which has shown us over the last 18 months that apparently we can uh, have 10 minute meetings without flying uh, for five hours. Thank you all. So I think that I'm also um, really cautious of the greenwashing because you know planting trees and um, trying to make sure that we are bolstering the environment I mean, we need to do that at a rate that is going to exceed current levels of deforestation, and that is very difficult to do, as well as it taking time for the environment to reabsorb that carbon. Uh, I know that there is research in carbon removal, and you know that's still a developing technology. Uh, but you know, I am a really big proponent of just if we don't want carbon, let's reduce the carbon. Let's not try to worm our way around it. Let's you know go direct. <laughs> I guess that's the engineer in me. Um, but like, let's just kind of go directly after the end goal, which is to have a net zero system. Great, thank you so much. Uh, we have one last question, and then if you want to have any closing comments, uh, but I think we have time for that too. Uh, and I really like this question because I think it uh, goes to something a little bit deeper, but uh, do we need better metrics, uh, new metrics about general well-being in life, uh, not simply income, unemployment, emissions, et cetera? So I would say yes. Oh, go ahead, Mark, you can go first. No, no, you go. Okay, um, so that's what my current research is about, trying to develop new metrics with the data. And a part of it is needing better data collection because we know that inequality and equity is really at the local level. And so aggregating it up to the state level, sometimes even to you know, the um, census tract or the uh, county level is going to mute that variability in people's lived experiences. And we wanna make sure that we are actually capturing that, which is why having data at the household level is ideal. But to do that, you need information on like what income are they, what's their minority status, what's the you know insulation of their home, what technologies do they have, and that can be, feel very invasive um, for people. So there is going to be this huge balance between privacy and metrics, and getting you know high quality data to try to say something meaningful about what people are experiencing currently and their levels of injustice that they're experiencing at their household levels. So one thing is, you know, a baseline of what is a reasonable amount of energy for a household to consume? Because one of the things that we're risking is if we're looking at a household over time and we're seeing their energy decrease over time, we may assume that they're becoming more efficient, they're adapting their behavior, right? They're, you know, maybe they've upgraded their air conditioning system and they didn't need as much over time, but that also could show lack of financial resources so maybe somebody lost their job, maybe their air conditioning broke and they didn't have enough money to fix it. And so, you know, that actually could be like a hidden form of poverty that may mask itself as efficiency. Um, and so then we really want to think about, you know, what are we trying to measure? Uh, there's another thing of, you know, with the urban heat island effect, looking at, you know, um, heat waves and how that's going to affect different people. We know that the insulation in the home really does matter, but also the quality of the air conditioner matters and that indoor t temperature could actually cause some people to experience heat strokes, hypothermia um, and other, you know, negative health effects, as well as if the humidity in the home is becoming too high, you're at higher risk of asthma and allergens entering your home. 
And these are, you know, really, they, they could be very high quality metrics that are just really hard to get because that data is proprietary. Um, and it's also a privacy concern for these households. And that's why trust is so important. People need to be like willing participants in that data sharing and that policy making about what's happening with their data. Um, but it also could open up the doors for greater incentives and, you know, different policies on helping people adapt and mitigate their experiences of poverty. Yeah, a really good point so all, all around. I think um, I would generally uh, propose that, you know, we need sort of a, a dashboard of, of key indicators and we kind of know broadly what those are. But, you know, uh, I, I think it's still an issue that in uh, politics and in economic modeling, uh, GDP is, is still really the, the dominant, um, you know, uh, predictor or, or outcome in terms of, of what's stated as a um, as, as you know, impact on quality of life. So like even here in, in the in the Canadian elections, we just had, um, there was some modeling that was done looking at the different party platforms. And it's like, well, the liberal platform would reduce GDP by, you know, two percentage points relative to baseline in 2030. And the green plan would reduce it by 7.5 percentage points of GDP. And it's like, well, so what? That, that same growth in GDP that's been rewarding the super rich, like that's not necessarily a helpful uh, indicator. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm wary of approaches that try to, to create like one big alternative uh, indicator. You know, I've done a lot of, uh, of, of looking at those, you know, various efforts, you know, over, you know, many, many economists over the past few decades. And they always sort of lead to the question, well, you know, for the indicators going up or down, well, what, what's actually driving that? And, you know, what are the what are the priorities that are baked into that particular assessment and how do you come up with the uh, the numbers in terms of like developing indices and, and stuff like that so uh, you know i think there's a lot of like just you know really core things and and um you know incomes you know poverty um you know trying to break those down into like different um impacts on different groups particularly vulnerable groups uh, and have a better understanding of of how that's all all playing out but yeah i, I think you know it's important that we we um measure progress, you know, uh, across a number of different uh, indicators, but just, I'm just wary of trying to like pin it all down on, on one alternative to GDP indicator. Um, thank you both so much. We have a couple of minutes, so I wondered if you wanted to have, me, uh, have a closing statement and perhaps a prompt could be, you know, I think a lot of folks come to this work and they're not quite sure what to do first. Uh, it's a, I think it's kind of a terrible frame because you need to do lots of things, but you know, what, what would be your advice for like, what, what is one thing, or even though I hate this one thing too, but how do you, how do you get involved? How do we start this? How do we start this momentum and this movement? Destiny, let's start with you. So when I'm, um, talking to people about you know, where to start because it does feel really overwhelming. One of the first things I tell people is that you know, some of us have had our entire lives to deal with this because it's a part of the lived experience and others are just coming in straight off the gate. So take a step and just breathe because it's okay to be overwhelmed. Um, and then really I think it's about getting educated in like what the definitions are, how it's evolved and really getting clear on what impact do you wanna have? Because if you're trying to like, you know, make everybody better all at the same time, you're going to end up missing that community aspect, missing focusing on the people that you were trying to help. And I think that with equity and equality, it's about trying to make, you know, the worst off community better. And if you are always working to make the people who are the worst off better, eventually everybody is going to get to a really good place. Yeah, really good points and, and great conversation overall. Thanks uh, so much. Um, it seems to me like a lot of like climate change itself and climate policy become very technocratic uh, very quickly with a lot of jargon and makes it very inaccessible for people who are listening. It also makes it easy for politicians to kind of bullshit their way through it. Um, and I think in, a, in the world we live in, uh, even with, with COVID, just the, the sheer amount of misinformation uh, and that's been reinforced through social media and it's posed like a huge challenge. And I, you know, we've seen the origins of that in, in climate change, you know, pre COVID, but I think that is going to be a really big barrier and it's kind of linked to some of the tribalism that Manuel talked about in his, his final comment. So uh, how do we get around that? How do we have 
like genuine conversations where people can see each other as people uh, can can listen to uh, each other's lived experiences, uh, listen to the circumstances they're facing in their lives that are barriers to, to making change, uh, and to uh, and to have means by which they can um, co-develop. Uh, you know policies about how things are going to work at a little really micro neighborhood or like an urban uh, scale. Um, I, I have some faith that that people can actually do that. That if we have good processes and good facilitation and people going in with good intentions, that you know even if they're they're divided uh, in terms of a political party or or right and left, that uh, if we have these conversations, uh, that we can actually make you know, substantial progress. So hopefully we can we can do that. Uh, and in the meantime, there's uh, there's strong roles for the public sector in terms of um, you know investments that are going to uh, improve uh, people's lives things in like public transit regulations and shifting away from like market incentives to actual rules you know you can't build a new house that's connected to the natural gas grid you can't build uh, new plants that are powered uh, by by coal um, you know you can't buy after a certain year a car with an internal combustion engine you know all of those uh, things I think are, are part and parcel of that but ultimately it comes down to humans and trust and and uh, conversations Great. Well, thank you all so much. Uh, thank you to our fantastic speakers and our audience for a wonderful session. Uh, this ends INET Live's climate debates. Uh, while there will be informal discussion happening now in the discussion lounge, if you wish to continue this conversation, uh, we do want to invite you to register for the next INET Live events, Just Transition and the Transition to Justice, which is happening on September 28th. Uh, you can find out more on the INET website or within the reception area of the event. Uh, thank you all again and have a lovely day.